Hello this evening and welcome to our October edition of Voices for the West, a webinar series brought to you by Advocates for the West. For those new to us, Advocates for the West is a nonprofit public interest environmental law firm. We provide free legal services to conservation organizations, Native American tribes, and concerned citizens in all 11 Western states. The title of tonight's webinar is Pillars of Conservation, Advocacy, Litigation, and Public Education. Before we get started, I want to offer a couple notes. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat section. And so that we can better get to know one another this evening, please take a minute and drop into the chat a wildlife species or special place that is meaningful to you and that you care about protecting. I am writing into the chat myself right now, Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. Uh, that is the state animal of Colorado where I live. Um, you will remain on mute throughout the course of uh, tonight's presentations. However, we do welcome your questions. And if a question comes to mind at any point over the course of tonight's talks, feel free to take a minute and drop it into the Q&A section. I will point out the Q&A is different from the chat, but is also located at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many of those questions as time allows toward the end of tonight's talks. Let's see what wildlife and special places are meaningful to our attendees this evening. The Colorado River, uh, Western Meadowlarks, Orcas, Slick, Scott, Slick Spot Peppergrass. I knew Todd Tusi was going to offer uh, Slick, not, Slick Spot Peppergrass, which uh, hardly anybody can even say um, as, as uh, one of his uh, favorite species. Um, I'm going to pull up our slideshow real quick, and then I'll offer a quick overview of how things will go this evening and what we're going to be covering. All right. So tonight we will be discussing a three-pronged strategy for promoting effective conservation policy utilizing advocacy, litigation, and public education. And we'll be discussing this strategy through the lens of sage-grouse conservation. We'll also highlight some other examples in which Advocates for the West and our partners are utilizing this strategy to protect and defend special places and wildlife throughout the West. We're honored to be joined tonight by Mark Salvo, Conservation Director at Oregon Natural Desert Association, Mark has petitioned to list three species and populations of sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, he's also drafted various pieces of legislation and managed a seminal species settlement agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're also grateful to be joined by Advocates for the West Senior Attorney Todd Tusi. Todd works out of our Boise office and has served as lead attorney on our Sagebrush Sea Project focusing on public lands management and endangered species protection across vast stretches of the American West. Our first speaker this evening is Mark Salvo. Mark. Thank you very much, Will. If you would proceed to the next slide, thank you. And in fact, you can get that guy off, thank you, off the slide. My name is Mark, Again, I work for Oregon Natural Desert Association. I am a long time associate with uh, Todd Tucci there at Advocates for the West and Will. We've been close partners on to, with Advocates for the West for many, many years in our shared mission to conserve Western public lands, waters, wildlife, and resilient climate, uh, resilient ecosystems. Um, I am privileged uh, and grateful to be here tonight to visit about this topic, uh, which is fascinating to consider, the intersection and the interdependence of advocacy, conservation education, and, and litigation. Uh, alas, I'm also known to go off topic. And so uh, we'll just know and hope that, that the script that I've prepared, the slides that we've assembled will help keep me on track. And then in the end, 
uh, you will all appreciate uh, and find interesting and maybe even learn a little something about uh, the subject uh, matter uh, this evening. Um, as Will noted, we'll use sage grouse as sort of an emblematic, charismatic uh, Western species uh, to help focus uh, this conversation about these three um, uh, uh, key components of conservation, of uh, public lands conservation in the West, education, advocacy, and, and litigation. And, 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 and Todd and I, and Will for that matter, have been talking about, writing about, advocating for, litigating to protect, and are still hard at work trying to conserve the species after already putting in, in some cases, more than two decades um, uh, into the effort. Um, so thank you again, Will and Todd, and for all of you for attending tonight's uh, presentation. I'm looking forward to it. Will, slide please. Okay, this is a greater sage grouse. This is why we love sage grouse. This is obviously a male sage grouse uh, displaying uh, on a lack. This species was once prolific in the uh, sagebrush deserts of the American West, extending over at that time what were, or what became 13 or 14 uh, Western uh, 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 states. Um, at one point, scientists estimate there were as many as 16 million uh, sage grouse um, in North America, including extending up into uh, at least two, or it became two Canadian uh, provinces. They were not only um, an indicator of, of, of the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem where they live and still are today, but in fact were um, um, a key influencer for how those ecosystems function. They are prey for a variety of predators and they themselves prey on other species. For example, uh, Mormon cricket outbreaks, grouse hopper outbreaks. This was a species that, that was affecting the system around it, uh, at least until um, uh, more recently when they were reduced to much lesser numbers. Again, this is obviously flamboyantly, noticeably, a male a greater sage grouse. Females are not so noticeable, purposely so, Will. There they are. Did you see them? Oh, go back, Will. <laughs> Did you see them? Those are the um, three female sage grouse that that male is uh, uh, displaying for. Uh, they're obviously not as noticeable and, and, and again, purposely so. Okay, well, next picture, thank you, or next slide. This is American's Serengeti, the sagebrush sea. Here you have, your, and admittedly, you have to kind of squint to see them, but you'll, you'll, you've got your Thompson gazelles uh, uh, spread across this lake. Again, uh, male sage grouse, this time displaying on a snowy landscape. But do you see yet the cheetah coming up to see if he can't pick one off? Will, click it once. It's right there. And one more time, if you would, sir. There it is, a coyote sneaking up uh, in the form of a cheetah, sneaking up on our sage grouse uh, on uh, displaying on the leg. This is sage grouse, when they display on their legs, are often an attractant for all kinds of other species. Coyotes, uh, golden eagles, Pronghorn are known to walk through sagebrush lakes and just sort of butt the males just for the fun of it, just to cause mischief, just to try to figure out what all those birds are doing on that lake bright and early in the morning, uh, in the uh, in it, and frankly, in the coldest of the winter days and leading into to spring. So there's a coyote coming up on the lake there. This is not an uncommon sight. Um, and uh, you will notice that, well, he's got everybody's attention. Nobody is actually moving. Yeah, that's it. That's in part because um, sage grouse have typically fought all morning for their position on the lek, and they're reluctant to give it up to, well, frankly, other male sage grouse unless they absolutely have to. Okay, well, the sagebrush sea is a gorgeous, beautiful, robust, vibrant, resilient ecosystem when managed and conserved. Um, this species, go ahead and will, or excuse me, this ecosystem supports hundreds of native plant and animal uh, species, uh, 
Um, even individual sagebrush plants will oftentimes support dozens of, of, of insects, uh, midges, fungi, lichens, even uh, species of ants and beetles. Um, 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 but again, only when and where this ecosystem is well conserved, uh, managed, uh, and or restored uh, on the landscape. Unfortunately, degraded or fragmented habitat does not support the same uh, diversity or biomass uh, that this system is otherwise uh, capable uh, of producing. Bill, thank you. Healthy sagebrush step is absolutely key to sage grouse reproduction, um, persistence, uh, and viability. Uh, again, if you look really closely, there is a sage grouse hen tucked away under the sagebrush there in the upper photograph. She will have as many as six to eight eggs in spring. And if they are both well screened uh, from predators, protected from wind uh, and uh, a direct sunlight, and otherwise surrounded by healthy habitat that supports wildflowers, um, uh, uh, insect life, and other uh, critical food uh, um, uh, sources, she will hatch out and successfully raise uh, six to eight chicks that most of which should uh, live uh, through the summer and into the fall and become juvenile sage grouse. Where those habitat conditions do not exist, uh, uh, science has shown that maybe one of the chicks hatched out in, in May or June might make it to the following fall. And that's a major problem for management, which is, well, if you would, unfortunate because chicks are so doggone cute. So if nothing else, this is a species we should conserve because the, the young sage grouse are adorable. Well, one more time. Unfortunately, much of this sagebrush sea is being sliced and diced by land use and development, both historic and also more recent um, um, uh, uh, incursions on the landscape, if you would, Will. Despite its size, and we're going to see more about just how large this ecosystem is, it is now considered one of the most endangered in North America. That's in part because of its fragility, uh, its, 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 its vulnerability to even the most uh, minor, if you will, or what you might consider to be the most minor uh, impacts uh, on the landscape. 26 uh, identified anthropogenic threats. The system has been reduced by approximately 50% since European settlement. And again, because of its aridity, uh, this system is, is very fragile, therefore very vulnerable uh, to um, uh, fragmentation and degradation and ultimately uh, habitat loss. Will, please. And unfortunately, the loss, the degradation, the fragmentation of habitat has had an, a, a market impact on sage grouse uh, populations. Uh, um, the the long-term declines in sage grouse populations are undeniable, and they are dangerous uh, to the species' long-term, uh, or perhaps even intermediate term, of, of persistence. This graph is from Oregon. That's where I'm located here in Bend, Oregon. And so we are especially focused on sage grouse populations in this state. But this is the same graph that you would pull for any of the other 11 Western states where this species uh, 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 is still uh, hanging on. You will notice in this, in this graphic, and especially on the left-hand side, sort of a jagged cycling. Uh, in the species population uh, 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 demography. Uh, that is because sage grouse have been shown uh, to um, 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 occur in sort of 10-year cycles where there's, a, there's an up pattern and then down, up pattern, then down, uh, which may be associated with uh, precipitation on the landscape, but also, uh, honestly, um, uh, uh, other factors may affect that uh, as well. But what you will also notice is, is that 10-year cycling, um, uh, and, and in this case, since the 1980, has occurred, the next high is never as high as the previous high before it, and the next low is always the lowest that sage grass has experienced in, in, the, in the recorded uh, demography uh, uh, or trend of the species. Range-wide, greater sage grass populations have declined um, uh, 80% since 
since 1965 and nearly 40% by 2002. Okay, well, but the species still does occupy in some ways, uh, shape or form, and in some, case, in some cases very sparsely, about half of its historic range. So we still have opportunity to recover this species and conservationists have expended ourselves uh, since the uh, uh, early 2000s, even before in some cases, developing listing petitions to protect sage grouse populations across the West and under the um, uh, a Federal Endangered Species Act. And this is a perfect transition now to Todd and advocates of the West for the West to pick up the story since we attempted to list these species of this greater sage grouse way back in 2003. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Todd Tusi here. I'm an attorney over at Advocates for the West. Been there for 20 years uh, since we started. Mark gave you a great background on the species. And we're looking at the three pillars of effective uh, conservation through the lens of sage grouse, but not only through the lens of sage grouse. I'll, I'll make a slight diversion in the second part of my conversation. But with that background knowledge of sage grouse, I want to kind of walk through two and juxtapose two cases we've had, I've had over sage grouse and differing results, differing inputs, and uh, well, differing inputs informing differing results. So next slide, Will. So the first case I want to talk about, I'm going to do it really quickly, but this is an important one. This is around 2004. This is the garbage resource area of southwestern Idaho, one of the most important areas for sage grouse. It's about 1.7 million acres. And this little map, I'm really quite proud of. Of course, I didn't do it, but but I got a GIS person to do it. And when you look there, you can see kind of the lex and then the average male. So basically, for a non-scientist like me, the pink is really important. Lots of lots of males, and then it goes down to the yellow, and then outside the yellow is the is the tan is the gray. So again, really important area, especially in southern Idaho. Um, historically, sage grass were all across uh, all across the garbage, and over the past twenty to fifty years. They've gone for, uh, 85 percent reduction in the number of sage grouse attending lex. Uh, occupied lex went down also 35, 37 percent. And many of the impacts here were a result of grazing, livestock grazing. The BLM itself had done what's called the Fundamentals of Rangeland Health Evaluation, which is kind of the benchmark, the baseline evaluation of the impacts that livestock grazing is having on certain um, um, uh, standards out there and the agency found that grazing was the cause for the or one of the causes for the decline okay so now ask yourself we have collapsing populations we have reduced um occupied lex we have grazing the cause of it one of the causes i'm not going to say it's the only but one of the cause so raise your proverbial electronic hand if you think the answer to this problem is more livestock grazing. So what, okay, I see not too many hands going up. Maybe Mac Lacey's hand is going up. Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. John, John Robinson, your hands, probably both of your hands are up in the air, more livestock grazing. Um, so what we have in 2004, no kidding. What we have is BLM almost doubling the grazing. <laughs> is almost doubling the grazing in this area. And not just anywhere, not no, not northern garbage where you see there's not that many lecks. They're grazing it in the most important areas for sage grouse conservation. 2004, next slide, Will. So, all right, I see this and I'm a young lawyer, not so young, but I was a lawyer. And I thought, well, this doesn't make much sense. And so in 2004, uh, partnering with our longtime esteemed partner, Western Watersheds Project, we sat down and said, we can't allow this to happen. And we moved forward with litigation in, in uh, May of 2004, got a temporary restraining order in, in June of 2004, where the judge said, whoa, 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 BLM, you are not allowed to increase grazing, period, exclamation point. And that's a pretty good win. Anytime in this world, 
where you get a TRO, that's a pretty good outcome. And so then I quickly turned it around. And I'm sorry, if you have questions on what these legal maneuvers are, by all accounts, put it in the question. Uh, and Will, by all accounts, you can um, uh, interject. And so at two months after that temporary restraining order, stopping the increase of grazing, we quickly moved to the judge, get in front of the judge, have a great argument in July of 2004. And the judge says, uh, BLM, again, we I enjoined you in the past. This time you were permanently enjoined. You may not increase grazing like you want to. Go back to the drawing board. And so I'm thinking, holy cow. And Laird, my boss and partner, and, and you all know and love him. And if you don't, you, you don't know him. Um, uh, we thought we had hit the home run here. And we had invested all of our time into litigation. We did not work with our clients to get public education uh, up to running, up and running. We did not do administrative or legislative advocacy. Every, our entire game was litigation. And so then go fast forward one year from then, from then, BLM had fixed the, some of the procedural problems. Well, they believe they, I should say they fixed some of the procedural problems that the court identified. And they again doubled the grazing. And so I remember sitting there thinking, okay, so this is a sitting duck. We had him the last time at uh, double in grazing. Nothing has changed. Sage grass continued to decline. Grazing continues to occur. And so we went running to federal court again. And this time we sought a quick summary judgment and a permanent injunction, not just barring the increase of grazing, barring grazing entirely. Again, this is litigation 101. This is what, we, that, that was all we had. This was, we were a one trick pony. We were not practicing what has, what I've come to identify as the three pillars of, of effective conservation advocacy. We were participating in one, that is litigation as the means and litigation as the end. All right, so great. So I got up in front of the judge and I convinced them that yes, the great the sage grass were, uh, collapsing, grazing was uh, occurring, and the only thing the judge did was in on um, on uh, uh, August second or August fourth, two thousand five, the judge issued an order that said, and I quote: "These circumstances require the immediate issuance of an injunction. The court will therefore enjoin all grazing on twenty eight allotments at issue." I literally got this note, this a uh, call from Laird as I was on the top roof of my uh, brother's house, re-roofing it for him. And I thought, holy hell, we've literally hit a home run. Not a, I mean, this is over the top. 1.87 million, million acres, a little less actually, 1.52 million acres, close to grazing. We've won because we were focusing only on litigation. Litigation as the means and litigation as the end. What happened? I'm not kidding you. That was a Thursday or a Friday. On Monday, we got a call from the governor's office from, it was Senator, who was it at the time? Oh, uh, Dirk Kempthorne and Larry Craig. It was, anyone who knows politics knows August is appropriation season. So we were getting calls that there's going to be a rider in an appropriation bill that's going to completely override that win. So what did we do? Well, we had a choice because we had not, and I own, I own this, this is not anybody else, because we had not developed the plans for legislative and administrative advocacy, because we had not developed the public education tools to help the public understand the impacts that livestock raising are having out there. We had to start negotiating away our home run. And over the course of, I'm not kidding you, six weeks, we literally, because we couldn't hold it, because we did not engage in the three pillars of effective conservation advocacy, we gave away our victory because it was either get something or get nothing. So we win a home run. We hit a home run August 2005. By November, pardon me, by October, we had given it away. Not completely. We still got something. But this was this to me was the low point in my 25 year career because we did everything we were supposed to do. The problem is we're supposed to do more than just litigate. We're supposed to, as attorneys and counsel to our clients, we're supposed to give them the big picture. 
make sure that they're engaging in advocacy, public, uh, leg public uh, education, administrative and legislative advocacy. So here's another option. And and next slide. So Mark is 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 um, uh, very kind, and and he speaks very quietly of himself. I think he was the one who submitted in two thousand in December two thousand and three the listing rule to list the, the the petition. Pardon me to list sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act. And when Mark did that, the population had to, as he said, I'm not going to go through this, declined 99% up to half, half of uh, the historic range. And the scientists at that time said there was, quote, no cause for optimism, okay? No cause for optimism. So what does the, BL, what does the Fish and Wildlife Service do in response to Mark's petition? They find there's reasons to be encouraged by the current assessments because a 69 to 99 percent decline in sage grouse populations is not 100 percent, and so therefore we're encouraged. Um, and next slide. So what began right in that time, uh, December 2005, 2006, advocates working on behalf of again. Western Watersheds project, but here, while Western Watersheds was the one client on the case, we were working very aggressively, uh, hand in glove with Mark, who at that point, I can't remember where you were, Mark, but you were running some shop and doing great work somewhere, um, and a whole bunch of other folks. So we made sure, we learned the lesson from the garbage that if it's litigation, and our litigation is 10 years out in front of our public advocacy, public education, legislative and, and, and administrative advocacy, we're going to get nowhere. So we tried something different. And I'm not trying to pretend like this was as focused as it turns out when I look backwards. We were, we were just trying to cover our bases. So Mark was going back to the to, to the halls of the Department of Interior at that time, and God forbid, but he was going to the Congress, and Andy Kerr, and we had a whole slew of folks that were not just playing the game of administrative and legislative advocacy. They were killing it. They were getting up on the hill, making sure everybody knew about the decline of the greater sage grass and the implications that has. But we didn't stop there. We They also created an entire... PR strategy, PR campaign, what does that look like? I don't know, I'm a lawyer, but ask Mark, he'll tell you what it looks like. Uh, and so what we did is we, once those um, uh, efforts un, uh, were created, we then brought pretty aggressive litigation. Laird and I brought pretty aggressive litigation. They were, these were not, uh, we, we had, we thought we'd get a, a, an objective judge. We brought hard hitting ESA litigation walking right into the deference sometimes the courts are going to pay for an aid to an agency but we had the facts and i'm not going to get into it but we win cases because we know it better than the government and so we presented a case that the court said was the most brazen case of political meddling he'd ever seen and julie mcdonald raise your hand if you remember julie mcdonald these feel like the good old days jesus would i like to have julie mcdonald instead of uh, Bernhardt running things over the Inter Department of Interior. But we had the judge convinced, this, these are his words, not mine, that Julie McDonald used her intimidation tactics in this case and altered the best science to fit a not warranted decision. So when this came down in oh, early 2007, maybe May 2007, it wasn't the earthquake that the garbage was. We had, I should say, Mark and his folks at Defenders and Center for Biological Diversity and Wild Earth Guardians and Western Watershed Project had already plowed the field. People were anticipating it. He had, we had worked so hard to demonstrate the science is dictating these decisions. The science is, is um, will determine what the outcome is. And so while um, we didn't win, we, we won that case. And we, the, I'm not trying to say that the fight is over. I mean, it's 18, 17 years later, and we're still fighting. But this is a demonstration of what can occur when you actually rely on the three pillars of conservation instead of just litigation. Look, I'm a lawyer. So every, I'm a hammer. So everything to me looks like a goddamn nail. And I want to just go out there and, and hammer everything. But the garbage told me and taught me that you can't do it that way. 
because irrespective of how good Advocates for the West is, how good Mac Lacey is, how good we all are, if our advocacy gets too far out, pardon me, if our litigation ad advocacy and strategy gets too far out in front of our other conservation pillars, we're not going to be able to hold victories. So those are that's and I'm going to hand it back off to Mark, but those are two examples that I wanted to demonstrate that that are perfectly juxtaposed in terms of uh, inputs and outputs. Mark, back or uh, yeah, back at you. Thank you, sir. That was excellent. Thank you. Okay, so just to complete the thought, and Todd and Will and I could offer an entirely separate, um, even two-hour seminar on just the just the the, the effort to list Greater Sage Grouse under the Endangered Species Act. They are still not listed. The bird continues to decline. Habitat continues to be lost due to a host of factors. In fact, Congress now prevents the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from even considering listing under the Endangered Species Act. So as Todd was describing, there's sort of this ebb and flow in conservation, even when you're able to effectively deploy all three legs of the, of the stool, advocacy, public education, litigation, sometimes you advance important conservation policies and sometimes you run smack into a wall. Uh, that happened to be Congress in 2014 when they decided to pass a rider that says the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can no longer consider sage grouse for protection of the Endangered Species Act. But let's pick up the story. As I mentioned previously, sage grouse still exist on as many as 100 million acres in the West. Um, uh, that is a huge range. Well, if you don't mind. And those in the know, states, industry, local working groups, conservation organizations, other stakeholders um, knew that, understood that. And even as we were petitioning and, and, and litigating and advocating, uh, states and other entities were also shifting into gear, uh, high gear, and producing more policies, more discussion, more resources at local, regional, and state levels to help conserve the species. Now, again, we could dedicate an entire seminar as to why many of these efforts fell short, and you could have you could have predicted that the moment that they that the moment that they were they were they were uh, published. Yet there was clearly a response to the advocacy, to the education, and the litigation uh, intended to conserve the species. Uh, Will, please. The threat of listing, the efforts underway at every level of government, uh, from local working groups to federal agencies themselves, of course, then drew the attention of news media. Papers were published in the, in the, in the policy uh, uh, journals, news outlets, uh, in some cases, uh, published uh, mass exposés on the species. They were front page news for, for, for many years. I remember one Wyoming paper dedicated four weeks in a row to telling the story about greater sage grouse, uh, the threats to its habitat, and what conservation of the species could mean uh, in the state of Wyoming. That in turn helped to generate public awareness for what this species was. And oh, by the way, the term was phrased or coined spotted owl of the desert. And so we, there was, there were some in our community, some in the news media who wanted to compare both the conservation opportunity or depending on your perspective, the uh, threat of conserving this species to what was uh, uh, you know, deemed to be one of the most disruptive conservation efforts in the Pacific Northwest. Nobody would say that today, but that was the case uh, uh, back then. Okay, Will, another slide, please. So it is important to note that the Bureau of Land Management, federal public land, the Bureau of Land Management is the major landowner in sage grouse range, uh, pictured here in the uh, brown uh, uh, coverage, as you will see that the Bureau has got pretty good representation um, uh, across uh, what remains of, uh, uh, of, the, of sage grouse distribution. Next slide, please. 68 BLM planning areas, districts, but also resource areas, um, include some amount of current uh, sage grouse uh, habitat. Next slide, please. 
in 2015, the Bureau of Land Management, similar to state governments, uh, state fish and game agencies, local working groups and other entities, responded to the increased interest and demand for conserving this species. They began an unprecedented planning process to re-examine how federal public lands are, uh, BLM lands in this case, but also the U.S. Forest Service, are managed for uh, to conserve uh, and restore uh, sage-grouse populations. For better or for worse, they grouped the planning uh, efforts into uh, 15 sub-regions. You can see them uh, 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 pictured here. Um, they addressed a broad spectrum of threats in those 2015 plans. Uh, it was a huge step forward. Nobody would deny that. But but these plans were also not uh, without their without their flaws. Um, um, they do, uh, uh, in many ways, address some deficiencies in in BLM management. What were, in many ways, historic just blindness to what sage grouse need. Uh, both now and in the future, um, as well as the hundreds of other species of plants and animals that depend on a sagebrush a, a step uh, habitat. Um, um, uh, uh, really quickly, the Trump administration in 2019 thought that even those plans had gone too far and sought to reverse many of the key conservation measures found in them. Advocates for the West, backed by a phalanx of organizations, advocates, um, 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 uh, and supportive uh, members of Congress and in 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 those uh, in the agencies challenged those 2019 plans and and put them on ice, brought the 2015 plans uh, 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 back to the fore, and that's what we have today for greater sage grouse. BLM is now in the midst of new planning for sage grouse under the Biden administration to see if they can't shore up some loose ends and make these plans more or less vulnerable to 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 amendment in the future let's just say let, let's just leave it at, at, at that um one a slide again please on the private land side it's important to note that the federal government made unprecedented investment in sage grouse conservation i still have not decided myself after more than 20 plus years of working to conserve this species whether some of these working lands initiatives are really helpful uh, to sage grouse. But in some cases, after you've elevated the importance of conserving a species and its habitat, and you've pressed decision makers uh, to do something about it, uh, and appropriators uh, do what they do, which is throw money uh, at the problem, huge unprecedented efforts are made then on behalf of the critter. And in this case, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture invested tens of millions of dollars since about 2012 uh, in working landscape sort of conservation programs to help boost uh, sage grouse numbers on non-federal uh, lands in all 11 states where they still exist. I had seen some really interesting report outs from how some of those programs are working. In some cases, it is undeniable that they're helpful to the species and have attracted new land owner support and interest in doing something on their own private lands uh, for uh, sage grouse, admittedly in, in, in exchange for uh, 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 compensation. Uh, support, federal support uh, to do that conservation work. But Will, slide please. Back to the BLM planning process currently underway or underway again, the next big BLM range-wide conservation strategy. Every time there's a new planning process, again, leveraged by strategically placed litigation, advocated uh, by the conservation community and backed by public support as, as, as they are educated on the, on the issue in the news media and other outlets. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to, to promote and, 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 and identify what the species still needs uh, for its long-term persistence. So as part of this current range-wide planning process, uh, conservation organizations, including uh, Oregon Natural Desert Association, have proposed establishing a range-wide system of sagebrush reserves that should be specially managed 
uh, and preserved for sage grouse and hundreds of other species that depend on this landscape. So we'll advocate for that, we'll promote that. We will see if this administration might be willing to think about how do you identify and literally bound uh, areas on federal public lands and reserve them uh, for sage grouse conservation. But even as we're doing that, what is interesting to me, and just to uh, wrap up my uh, uh, comment on, on our theme tonight, the three-legged stool, it is fascinating to see how everything from just local working group conversations to, 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 to resource management planning efforts that extend across millions of acres of a given BLM district are all irreversibly, irretrievably, um, 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 uh, always considering sage grouse as sort of the first issue that they need to address in conserving uh, and, and prescribing management for public land. Well, go ahead and hit a button. So for example, showing up in pink, but maybe not as uh, maybe not as discernible as I'd hope. Right there, that's the Southeast of Oregon Resource Management Plan Amendment. Sage grouse conservation there have driven an entirely different transportation management scheme for that plan intended to conserve the species. Well, hit it again. Over there, that's the Greater Heart Sheldon. Hopefully you can see that little pink oval there. Sage grouse are going to be the key species for how not one, not two, but three different planning processes currently underway on that landscape are going to unroll uh, over the uh, forthcoming months and years uh, for how best to conserve uh, that habitat. Again, well, that little circle within the larger circle is a, it represents a major effort underway to establish an Owyhee Canyonlands National Monument. You, monument. you better believe that sage grouse are a spoke species uh, for that effort. And again, well, that little circle represents sort of the southern flank of Steens Mountain, the best that I can put it. Right there, there's a local planning process that's intended, or a local restoration process that is intended to conserve sage grouse. It is, the key reason why they're why they're pursuing that little restoration piece down there, and yet it's an opportunity for organizations like Honda to engage, promote, see if we can improve the project, and then see how it might work for the species in the in the long term. And again, well, finally, just to show you the uh, uh, the breadth uh, of the spectrum of 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 planning and management that occurs uh, across sage grouse range, that little circle right there represents. Deschutes County, that's where I live, Deschutes County's current process to site a new landfill, a new dump. <laughs> and, 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 and in Deschutes County, they're thinking very carefully whether, and if so, how a landfill could possibly be sited anywhere near Sage Grouse Branch. It's just one more example about how Sage Grouse in many ways are leading even local planning efforts for, 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 their importance, their representation of the of the sagebrush sea ecosystem, and 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 the need to conserve both uh, uh, for future generations. Okay, back to Tom. All right. So I have about four or five minutes, maybe three, if I if, if I can speak quickly, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. But before I turn to this next brief topic, to kind of a further illustration of how advocates and its allies and partners are practicing. Uh, are using all three legs of the stool. I will say, you know, when Mark says that uh, our you know, sage grouse have yet to be listed despite all of our efforts, of course that's right. And that's unfortunate. But it is it really demonstrates not that our prior work was uh, unsuccessful because you have to step, this is a presentation on the three stools of public engagement, not the three stools of our sage grouse litigation efforts. I mean, Advocates for the West Back in 2004, uh, Laird and I kind of identified three a three-legged stool of sage grouse litigation strategy, and only one of which was listing. We knew that list if ever you put your entire eggs in the basket of listing, you will you may come up short. So what we did at the time, and what Mark talked about, is we talked about both listing and then programmatic level decision making, resource management plans, big area planning, and then implementation decisions grazing decisions, um, vegetation treatment decisions. And it was only, we decided in 2004, it was only um, through those three uh, strategies would we create, or at least help create all of the public push for protection of, of sage grass range wide. Okay, so, and Mark's been amazing at it, of course, but very briefly, because I don't even know that I have three minutes left. 
I want to talk to you about an ongoing project that, that I'm working on that our, our clients and allies are, are working the three pillars picture perfectly. And by the way, just because our efforts are perfect doesn't mean our outcomes are predetermined. We don't know, but we, we don't know how it's going to come out. But we do know if we don't do it and we don't do it right, we do know how it's going to come out. The highway will be put in. This is the map of the of the um, Red Cliffs National Conservation Area outside right north of St. George, Utah. The you will see in the green cross hatch that is uh, Mojave Desert tortoise designated critical habitat within the Red Cliffs National Conservation Area on um, January 16th, 15th or 16th. Uh, uh, Secretary is, uh, of 2021, Secretary Bernhardt approved a highway, a four-lane high-speed highway that is that purple line right there, right through the heart of, of um, Mojave Desert tortoise habitat and right through a national conservation area. Now, I know I'm not the smartest guy on this video, but I don't think a national conservation area is supposed to be managed for a highway. Next slide, Will. But it's not just a national conservation area, and it's not just designated critical habitat. It is the most dense population of desert tortoise in the entire area. They're throwing a highway through the middle of it. Next slide. So I, which, you know, I'm a hammer. Everything's a nail. I file a lawsuit, conserve Southwest Utah, and and. All the well, Mark's not on it, but it, Defenders of Wildlife and seven other clients that we brought a hard hitting litigation. But years leading to that litigation, the uh, we adopted a formal campaign plan following the three pillars. And what works in one area may not work in another area. You know, you have to do the FDR approach. When you see a problem, do something. If it doesn't work, do something else. And if it does work, do more of it. You just got to come up with ideas. So the 32,000 public comments, is that a home run in itself? Hell no, but it's part of it. We So then we had a lobbyist, and I'm, when I say lobbyists, I don't mean paid lobbyists. I mean people like Mark and others. This happens to be folks from the Conservation Lands Foundation and Conserve Southwest Utah, who repeatedly went to Washington, D.C., who got two committee letters from the House of Representatives opposing this, one of which included Secre now Secretary Holland. There was media outreach. We had 80, 90, 100 media hits on a highway in Utah. We visited, uh, the White we visited the White House, Council of Environmental Quality. We walked through the Department of Interior. We went to the Secretary's office. We did another whole, we needed a media pitch. So a year after that, we put a petition together to protect Red Cliffs, got 35,000 separate signatures, De uh, handed that to leader leadership in the Department of Interior. We created a 74, I don't even know what a zine is, guys. If you know me, you know I'm not technical, but a 74-page zine, which I think is like a magazine, that was amazing. Local artists, local writers, local poets, local uh, businesses, lo you know, all talking about the impacts that this desert tortoise has on them, their community, and their livelihood. This case is not over, and we don't know if we're going to win. I'm reasonably confident we're going to win, but I can. So, so we're doing this without certainty of success. But in the absence of it, you can be damned well sure of certainty of failure. And it's only through kind of coordinated efforts amongst the the clients to to follow this three pillars. I believe that is the key to successful conservation in the long term. I think I went over. I'm sorry. Uh, but I think we'll take some questions. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Todd. Um, we have time for some questions and we have some questions. The first one, I think, is a, a, a point of clarification more than anything. I think we kind of beat around the bush at, uh, on it when, when Todd was talking about the garbage litigation. The question is, do you focus on private landowners grazing rights or do you tend to focus on federal agencies for your advocacy and legal work? Um, Mark, I know you talked a little bit about the uh, natural federal natural resources conservation services programs that have come about. Can but can you both kind of speak to that question? My my my, my answer is easy. Probably Todd's too. 
Oregon Natural Desert Association is a federal lands conservation organization. We're focused on, 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 on permitted livestock grazing on federal public land. But there is occasion we're able to interact with private landowners, whatever they may be doing on their private lands. And sometimes we're able to learn a little something in those interactions that uh, might be best, might, 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 might even apply to federal land management. Yeah, there's you just building on that. There's there are fewer legal hooks from a litigation perspective. There are fewer legal hooks to be brought to bear on on private lands than there are on federal lands. That does not mean that the result of our federally focused litigation has no impact on private lands because it does. It's just that they're not the target. They're not the focus of our efforts. And and I got to tell you, that's for a bunch of reasons. One of which demonstrated itself in the garbage which is um, they would put up a 75-year-old rancher coming in and saying what the impact of my proposals would be on his private lands. And I could easily say, whoa, we're talking about federally public lands, Judge. Um, and so they do have an impact, but our target and our focus from a litigation perspective is on, is, on public land, is on federal public lands. Mark, I'm curious if you might be able to address this question. It is, do sage grouse populations bounce high during high grasshopper years? Great question. And while I cannot answer it specifically because I don't know of the scientific literature and I have a garage full of papers, uh, so I would have seen something on it, but th this much I do know. The grouse tend to cycle, as noted um, previously, uh, based on, on, on weather patterns. And it is also true that if it, that the grasshoppers, mormon crickets, and other insect populations probably do better in those maybe cooler, maybe damper years. So we just had one, right? We just had a very uh, wet year in Oregon's high desert. We had grasshoppers and mormon crickets everywhere. And in some places, grouse populations either held even or even increased. And one would have to, um, uh, for 2023, one, 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 one one would at least have to observe that there was basically more food available on the landscape, not just in the form of insects, but wildflowers um, uh, um, uh, and other forage that, that, that grouse depend on. And so it, it kind of makes sense that, that, that a, a good bug year would also support a good grouse year. Um, boy, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to answer this question, but it is um you know that i'll, I'll pro provide a, a statement first the cow is absolutely unsuitable for sage grouse habitat and about 90 percent of the western usa is unsuitable for cows why not just ban public grazing allotments seems simple enough <laughs> what, so what i'm a, I, i'll speak just because i tend to fill voids but mark is the one who who has been running herd here if you will look this is really hard the the mystery and the romanticism of the marlboro man the western rancher is alive and well and has an outsized influence in the calls of congress frankly and in the halls of every administration democrat or republic a republican uh and so that is a really heavy lift what we've tried to do Mark, not just, you know, all the groups that are working on livestock grazing has tried to use, in some respect, litigation to soften the ground for subsequent um, legislative and administrative outcomes. And so, and, and Mark has, has led the charge for 20 years on voluntary grazing retirement. You know, you, you it, it's a lot easier to bring the, the Marlboro man into the corral if you, well, shit, I'm not going to go with that metaphor for too long. Uh, it's a lot easier to bring them to our side if we can give them something as opposed to just banning it. I mean, it is a it, it is a unbelievably heavy lift. There are states out there where there have been their legislation is passed and states out there where grazing retirement is an option. Central Idaho, for example, uh, where you can a rancher, if you're within a certain area, you can voluntary voluntarily relinquish your permit and BLM can and should uh, retire it permanently. Mark and I, back in the early 2010s, tried to get that as, as uh, models in Oregon and, and Arizona, or no, Oregon and New Mexico, uh, and we couldn't quite get there. And that demonstrates, and I'll listen, I'll shut up for, for listen to Mark, 
But that just demonstrates the difficulty of, of this effort. You know, even making it voluntary and even paying them for it. Um, it's kind of the um, uh, the end of public lands grazing if you are a uh, public lands counselor or other advocate for livestock grazing. But Mark, I should let you just talk the whole time. I, 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 all I can add, thank you, that's perfect. All I can add to that is you noted incredibly difficult challenge politically. Um, today, Will and Todd and I received notice of another letter signed by uh, 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 Western senators uh, once again uh, asking their colleagues in the appropriation committees to continue the ban on uh, 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 the prohibition on the Fish Wildlife Service considering greater sage grouse for listing under the ESA. There's a very powerful political uh, um, uh, caucus in uh, both the House and the Senate that are responsive to and protective of this particular permitted privilege on federal public lands. There's no rights about it, as Todd will tell you. Um, and, and so, um, yes, uh, noting that in other industries where where market challenges, drought, competition, degraded systems, other factors might affect uh, sort of the the not just the profitability but even the tenability uh, of, the, of 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 an industry, as happened with the, the the tobacco quota buyouts, the peanut quota buyouts, the dairy retirement program from eons ago. Uh, uh, I have, and we are all still part of sort of a conversation about uh, just permanently retiring grazing permits while also offering permit holders some amount of compensation to uh, that reflects sort of their lifelong investment in 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 those public lands grazing allotments and their in their in their uh, uh, small businesses uh, that depended on them. And as as Todd noted, there are allotments around the West, areas around the West where we've had, where we successfully um, uh, 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 legislated uh, grazing permit retirement, including here in Oregon and in Idaho and in the Southwest, California, Nevada. And we also know that there's also uh, uh, probably as many uh, allotments that have also been quietly retired. Uh, gentle person's agreement between folks with money and who would rather cows not be on public lands and grazing permittees who've had enough and are looking to retire or move on or restructure their business. And those are a little harder to track because they're just sort of quietly done between the payor, the payee, and the managing agency. But we know they're out there. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are at least a couple of million acres of federal public lands that have been retired from grazing in that way. Both legislated and quietly. <laughs> um, for the next question, I'm interested in how groups like advocates in ONDA are infusing emerging climate science and or climate policy into their litigation, um, advocacy or education efforts to protect the sagebrush sea. Mark, you want to take that one? I'll I'll follow up. Yes. <laughs> and 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 because climate change is undeniable, and especially here in southeastern Oregon where we work, uh, the models have shown, and frankly the weather, uh, if you should visit on an August day, is that this is one of the uh, fastest warming uh, uh, areas uh, in the country, perhaps even North America, due to climate change. And of course, the West is in uh, not just a current drought, but a drought that scientifically now may have may may be extending back hundreds of years. Um, all of those are obviously having deleterious impact on 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 wildlife, on habitat, and climate resiliency of the public domain. Uh, to that end, uh, my colleague, who's out there somewhere, uh, 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 in, uh, hopefully enjoying our presentation right now, Mac Lacey, was part of a scientific study that helped to understand um, uh, to what degree public lands livestock grazing may be affecting uh, both contributing to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also affecting uh, a high desert ecosystem's ability to sequester uh, carbon. And frankly, their findings were impressive. They were even shocking uh, to some degree to uh, what effect um, a, a relatively few number of cows compared to grazing nationwide, uh, but even a relatively small number of cows are having an outsized 
uh, impact on, on, on both of those questions, how much they're emitting, but also how much they're affecting an ecosystem's ability uh, uh, to, 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 to sequester carbon. We are very actively promoting that science in agency planning and, and arguing that the agency now needs to consider that as uh, the same kind of environmental impact as you would a cow, you know, defecating in the middle of a of a, of a trout bearing stream. That's an impact, but so is the cow's effect on an ability of an ecosystem to sequester carbon, to be resilient uh, to climate change. And so this is sort of an interesting, um, timely, uh, in many ways, kind of new question that's before us because the science now is is catching up and 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 helping to provide sort of a basis for arguing. Uh, uh, and supporting um, um, uh, planning in this in this area. We have other questions. Will Mark did a better job than I ever would have done, so let's just leave it at that. Yeah, I would note um, since you mentioned the the study, Mark, that um, Mac was an author of. Um, if any was anyone is interested in seeing a webinar on that study. Uh, we have one from one year ago this month uh, that can be found on um, Advocates for the West YouTube channel in which another one of the uh, authors um, uh, joined us to, to uh, highlight the findings and talk about. Um, very fascinating study. Um, we have uh, time for one more question, um, and that is, who does the public relations education pillar? Um, and and the second part of that question is how is it paid for? Um, do either one of you want to? I'd I'd be happy to address it uh, to some degree myself. It's 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 been my experience in the campaigns that I've been involved with through my work at Advocates that it is often a shared responsibility, where you know we we can kind of easily identify whom in the campaign, what organizations, in other words, are going to handle litigation, uh, which ones are going to handle advocacy. Public education is very much uh, a shared responsibility and something that everybody um, is involved with to some degree. Um, anything either of you want to add to that? No, I think that's right. Yeah. I, mean, I, oh, yeah. I would only I would only offer that if you've got a robust campaign, a great coalition working together, the lawyers, the educators, the advocates, uh, the media specialists all doing their part. That that uh, uh, that is also something that that just regular news media wants to report on. And and so much of our success in getting the word out is just raising sort of uh, the important issues to the attention of uh, you know for those who uh, and I don't know if this if this is now outdated, Will, but for those who uh, you know buy ink by the barrel, maybe that maybe that's no longer relevant in this world. Uh, uh, but you notice that both Mark and I have, a, or Todd and I have a little bit of gray hair. See, this is the way we think: ink by the barrel. And 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 when it came down to Todd's work on on reversing that not warranted listing decision for Greater Sage Grouse, we invited the New York Times to cover it. <laughs> that was important, <laughs> and they did. Um, well, thank you, Mark and Todd, for providing insight into our work and, and highlighting some of the projects, you know, now underway and the, the work that's ongoing to protect not just the sage grouse, the, the sagebrush ecosystem, uh, but other wildlife and special places as well. Um, and, and thank you to our attendees this evening for your, your thoughtful questions. This important work that, you know, to, to defend iconic Western landscapes and their inhabitants that groups like Advocates for the West and Oregon Natural Desert Association is doing is only made possible thanks to supporters like you who are with us tonight. If you feel inspired, we hope you will give a gift to help us continue this important work. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email, including links uh, to ways that you can support our organizations, but also a recording to tonight's webinar on YouTube. Please feel free to share it far and wide with anyone who you think might be interested uh, in our work. Um, lastly, I'll note that Advocates for the West is planning one more Voices for the West webinar in 2023. It will be in early December and in honor of our 20th anniversary uh, which we're celebrating this year, we plan to recap some of our biggest victories to defend public lands. 
water, fish, and wildlife over the last two decades. We also have a few surprises in store for that webinar. So stay tuned in the weeks ahead for details. And with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you.